Welcome to the Teaching with Creativity show. I'm your host, Susan Riley, and the founder of EducationCloset.com. Today, my guest is Susan Thomas. She has developed something really incredible with her team, a set of 21st century learning scales that teachers can use both in the arts classroom and in the general education classroom for various purposes. Today's interview, I'm going to be diving into those scales with her, as well as a variety of other topics about arts integration and STEAM from a leader's perspective. Welcome, Susan. So, Susan Thomas, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you asked me. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how that all kind of works into arts integration and STEAM. Okay, well, um, I never envisioned myself doing what I was doing. Um, when I, I always had a love for music and science. But, uh, you know, like most young kids, I decided that music or fine arts is not where the money was. So I started college actually as a pre-med major. Really? Right. And um, needless to say, I, I didn't enjoy it. And as, <laughs> it wasn't as fun in college as it was in high school. Um, so, you know, I decided after actually several years that it was more important for me to enjoy what I do yeah. than to bring home a huge paycheck because, you know, education maybe isn't quite where the big bucks are. Mm -hmm. But um, I had actually been in college for four years before I went into music education and completed that program in two years doing, you know, between 25 and 28 credits a semester just to be done with it, right? So did you do, um, what program did you do, I mean, other than pre-med, was it just pre-med for four years? Um, no, actually, I had a little trouble deciding what I wanted to do with my life in college, but um, I went from pre-med actually to psychology. Wow. And um, went through the psychology program and then realized there was a huge waiting list for the practicum. Mm -hmm. And in the two years that I finished music education, I would have then been ready to do the psychology practicum. So I mean, I suppose if I would have stayed another year, it would have been a double major, but I was kind of done with college. So um, why? Right? Why? So, um, so yeah, I uh, thought I was going to be a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely positive I was going to teach high school until I student taught high school, and realized <laughs> was not not where I belonged. And I, I was. Um, not around small kids, wasn't many in my bank of experience. Yeah. I walked into my first day of teaching at Benjamin Franklin Elementary School and one of the fifth grade girls had cross-stitched me a bookmark to welcome me. Oh. That was it, I was home, right? I was, it, was, it was amazing, it was so natural for me to just show these children how to do what they were doing and I, and I was hooked. Oh. So, um, I guess about 20, I, I won't date myself too much, but over 20 years in the classroom um, between Baltimore County and Frederick County uh, has now landed me in the position where I am now. And uh, my title says Curriculum Specialist for PK-5 uh, Visual and Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. And what that means for those, I guess not in the education world, is my biggest um, priority is to be the support for my teachers to deliver a top quality uh, arts experience for our kids because you have to have both. You can have great teachers, but great teachers don't work without a great curriculum and vice versa. So my, my yeah. biggest uh, championing is of the excellence of curriculum and staff for our kids in Frederick County. I love that. I um, was actually just reading a piece and I really wish I remembered who it was from, but somebody was talking about the idea of supporting kids supporting teachers or supporting curriculum and as a leader our job is to always support teachers and students first and the curriculum is designed to lift them up mm -hmm. and to help them explore so that when people talk about standards first they're getting it wrong that it's really people first mm -hmm. and then your standards yes and being able to serve that so I think you're in total alignment with that, which I love. Absolutely, yeah, you can have the best curriculum in the world, but if you don't have the relationships with the students, mm -hmm. what you're trying to teach them just doesn't doesn't go as far unless you have that personal connection with the child. Yeah, it doesn't land, yeah. so. And you know what, we're in the enviable position of literally being able to watch our students grow up. Yes. We see them year after year, and um, you know we develop that connection with them that a lot of the grade level teachers just don't. They yeah. see them for a year, and, and that's the end. That is so true, and it's such an honor. Like I always felt it was such an honor to watch 
when they come in as kindergartners and then they leave at fifth grade to go into middle school and you're like, I got to see all of that. I was able in that moment of time to just watch all of it. So it's very cool. So you have helped to spearhead the work on a new kind of set of 21st century skill scales. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a tough one to say. I'm <laughs> glad you said it. Skill <laughs> scales, yes. So talk to us about what these skills are and what why you kind of helped to work on this. Okay, um, yeah, you know, it's been a very reflective couple of years for me because, you know, sometimes, you know, 20, hindsight is always twenty twenty. The the saying goes, and I always sit back and think, I look at my teachers in the classroom now and I'm constantly saying, oh, if I only knew how you did it, or if I only saw that, I could have done that myself. And what I've been trying to do as a, a curriculum leader now is to sort of guide the mind frame away of more of what my experience was like in the fine arts as a child, where if my composition didn't look and sound like my teacher's, mm. it wasn't right, right? Or if my artwork didn't look like Mrs. So-and-so's hanging on the wall, then it wasn't done right. And that's just, I'm not necessarily saying, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's not how I think then, but it's just, it's the way a lot of the people in my age bracket were brought up, that our job was to mimic the teacher to be considered successful. So I started to do a lot of reflecting of how can we move away from cookie cutter artistic experiences mm -hmm. and really get the children involved in becoming sort of their own champion of their artistic experience. Mm -hmm. And I kept hearing the, the phrase 21st century skills, 21st century skills, and I, I, I knew what they were, but admittedly, sometimes I'm a little hesitant to jump on the train of the newest thing in yeah. education. So I sat back and let it brew a little bit, but I will tell you the turning point for me was an arts integration conference at UMBC this past spring. Mm -hmm. Um, we had the introductory session, they had the, the breakouts, and one was called 21st Century Skills in Fine Arts. And I thought, okay, if it's here at MSDE, then it must be getting some teeth somewhere. So I, I went to listen, and the, the presenter was great. I wasn't exactly sure what I had signed up for, but I watched and I listened, and just it was, it was the proverbial light bulb, like the mind-blown moment of, this is it. This is how to get away from cookie cutter artistic experiences. This is how to engage in reflection, in the collaboration, because all of the 21st century skills are things that we've been doing for years. Mm -hmm. Kind of like my own realization of arts integration. I had been doing it for years, but I didn't know what it was called. Mm -hmm. It was just, well, yes, we read. Yes, we act things out. Yeah, we do all of that kind of stuff. Right. And that was the beginnings of the arts integration. Well, the 21st century skills, oh my gosh, we do this stuff all the time. You do group art projects, you do group things, you talk about, you know, you have your gallery walks and your artist statements. So um, one of the most intriguing parts was it took us two hours to get two columns of one indicator of one of the 21st century skills. Wow. And I'm like, this isn't for the faint of heart. Right. <laughs> but this is gonna happen in Frederick County this yeah. summer. So uh, the beginning part of the the presentation was, you know, we assess what we value, mm -hmm. and essentially, why are we assessing only the end product? Mm -hmm. Why, who, and that got me thinking, so, okay, if we're assessing the end product, whose creativity are we assessing? Mm -hmm. I must be assessing my creativity and judging a child based on how creative I thought they were. Right. Hang on, that's a game changer. That is huge. So. I dedicated two weeks of my curriculum writing to a 21st century skills workshop and tried my best to put in a small paragraph what this was. Mm -hmm. Please let people sign up. And, and <laughs> I, I got quite a few. It was a great range. I had visual art and music. Some teachers had just finished their first year. Some teachers had been teaching over 20 years. So I had a, a fabulous you know, umbrella perspective from the teacher's standpoint. And um, brought them in. I facilitated the workshop. And for the first 45 minutes, it just... It was very heavy duty, what is this and why are we doing it? And it was so gratifying because one by one, just they got it, yeah. their faces got it. And um, it took us probably two or three days to do one scale. And we started with the creativity scale, thinking that might be the easiest of the, of the mm -hmm. four. But once they got it and once we started working through language and, and it, was, it was really something to watch the 21st century skills working mm -hmm. in the 21st century skills <laughs> workshop, you know? They are collaborating, we're talking about, we're picking over vocabulary words, which yeah. is fantastic. Um, 
So they were able then to really kind of flow very smoothly through the other creativity scales. Mm -hmm. And uh, we presented them in August to the rest of the music and art staff. And they were just like, it was like a hallelujah chorus. You could almost see it over some teacher's yeah. heads going, this is perfect. Because where we're going with this here is in our county, students get not only the traditional letter grades for music and art, but they also get an effort grade. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, the water starts to get a little muddy. Yes. Because some of us may get straight A's in visual art because that's where our affinity is. Mm -hmm. But then that's zero effort. Well, that doesn't make any sense. How can I have a zero on my report card with an A? And how do we talk to parents in the community and some administrators that don't have the fine arts background mm -hmm. and also don't have the privilege that we do of, I've had this child six years. I know what they can do and where right. they are. Right. But you know, in the, the quantifiable database society that we're in, because I said so, mm -hmm. there's no space for that on the report card. So we created these scales too as a series of talking points to show this is what it looks like in music and art. It's not just picking up a crayon and copycatting a teacher. It's not just picking up a pair of maracas and parroting back what the music teacher does to you. That's kind of where it came about. Wow. There's so much gold right in there in that <laughs> whole explanation. Because, and I want to back up just a little bit, and I'm coming off script a little bit, sure. so I'm surprised. <laughs> but there's, there's two pieces in there that I kind of want to touch on. The idea of cookie cutter art, um, mimicking music, that kind of, of teaching. There's a huge conversation about whether or not that is that has any value anymore or whether we should do totally away with that and go into more of a uh, individualized process-based um, approach to teaching. Do you find any value in that kind of um, previous thinking or things that we've done in the past in that way? I do, uh -huh. depending on the age and ability level of the student and their prior experiences. Mm -hmm. In elementary school, I do think there needs to be a level of artistic mimicry because we are the ones who provide the skill to them. They don't have an experience bank to, to right. draw back on. So in, in K1 and sometimes in 2, mm -hmm. I do expect there to be a whole lot of similar looking artwork because they're just trying to figure out what the what the technique or what the skill is yep. but then where these scales and where where my um my gentle nudging if you will would be is now that they've got the skills what are you going to do with it right. now that they can create a piece of artwork based you know that looks very much like a romero brito piece what could you do with that style and that technique that brito didn't do and that's where you move on with it. Right. So, you know, if you're in middle school and high school and you're still imitating your teacher, I don't know necessarily that there's so much artistic growth there. Yeah. But especially in the primary grades, yes, we are the, we are the keeper of the keys of how to actually do it. Right. But then we're also the keeper of the keys. So show me what else you can do once you've got the skill. Yeah, and I think what's so great about these skills that I love is that you're able to use them to look at both the process and the product. Mm -hmm. Because, and I talk about all the time, that your process is going to be a direct reflection of the product that comes out of it, right? Yes. So, but there has not been um, a very easy or clear way to kind of evaluate, not even, even evaluate, but assess that process. Mm -hmm. Because it is so creative. It is so subjective because everybody's process can look a little different. Mm -hmm. So these scales give a, a bit of a, a bridge to kind of look at that process in a new way, which I think is great. I also came across a really interesting uh, conversation over the weekend on a Facebook group about whether or not arts teachers should be required to assess at all in the elementary, specifically in the elementary grade levels, but even in the high school grade levels that, you know, teachers are being required to do SLOs, also known as SGOs, any kind of, so they're being evaluated on student growth. Mm -hmm. And there is a huge argument for not assessing at all because art and music are the places where students go to kind of relax from all of that pressure and stress from the academics. What do you think about that? How do these scales kind of help with that, do you think? 
I think sometimes um, there's a bit of confusion or muddying of the waters between assessing student growth and assessing achievement mm -hmm. by the end of whatever your targeted instructional area is for the SLO. And one of my own personal struggles is trying to quantify an unquantifiable discipline. Mm -hmm. um, trying to pigeonhole our kids into 90 to 100 is an A. You know, 80, it, it really doesn't work that way because just like we weren't all cut out maybe to go to college, we're not all cut out to be artists and musicians. And the struggle is real for those of us who have an affinity for one but not the other, that if I could show this my way, I can demonstrate that I have the knowledge. And that's, that's really far out of the box for the way thinking is now with the paper and pencil multiple choice yes or no which is fine for theoretical skills, for labeling your color wheel, for doing note values or something like that, but the musicality and the artistry is gone. If right. you can order your dynamic levels from loud to soft, that's fantastic. I understand you know what they mean, but if you can't perform them for me, if you can't use them, right. that's not being a musician. So as far as doing away with assessing, I do think we need to assess, but part of the hurdle is getting past assessment does not mean stop instruction and here's a piece of paper. Right. right. And yes. we, I, I am as guilty right. as anybody else of that. For years and years and years, that's what an assessment was. Assessment equals test. Right. And it's a challenge for me now to be very careful to not even use the word assessment anymore because it doesn't mean test. Right. But we maybe even as a culture are so ingrained that that means a test, that this is the be all and end all, either you know it or you don't. And that's not really the case to get into that frame of ongoing. So do we need to assess? Yes, mm -hmm. but we need to maybe figure out how to change the mindset that an assessment isn't a quantifiable score on a paper, that it's, it's a curve, a beginning, a middle, and an end of just one year, that it doesn't stop, just like math skills and language arts skills don't stop, right. but to sort of change the idea of what assessment looks like in the fine arts, that it just doesn't look like an OPSCAN test would yes. you know, for the SATs or, or for a math test or something. Yeah, so in these 21st century skills, um, the scales that you've got created, first of all, tell us what the, the skills are that you develop them for, and then I want you to talk about how you kind of laid them out because this is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it was, I gave, I gave an awful lot of um, liberty to the team, figuring if they signed up for this and they didn't even really know what they were volunteering for, <laughs> I'm not going to sit in and, you know, be overly structured with this. But, uh, you know, we looked at, um, create, we looked at creativity first of the, the four, you know, collaborative thinking, or uh, collaboration, critical thinking. Uh, we did creativity first. I laid them all out for them. I took the, um, there were sample on the MSDE site, there were sample um, 21st century skill continuums, maybe I guess you could call them, and I showed them that. I'm like, here's our starting point. And when you look at sort of all of the indicators of them, I said, we can start wherever you want because no one is any more important than the other. Mm -hmm. And they decided that creativity is the, e is, in their words, the easiest one to start with. Okay, so then what does creativity look like? What do we want to do? What do we want to show? I said, we can't just focus on the end product, right? Okay, so what if we start at the beginning? So then you can see where they start and where they end. Okay, that's great. Well, what about all the stuff that happens in the middle? Mm. So now we've got, okay, so we have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then we started talking about levels. Mm -hmm. said, what we want to do is we don't want to substitute this as a grading guide. Mm -hmm. We okay. don't want to have five levels because I can already see what's going to happen. Yeah. Your master is going to be an A, your experience is going to be a B. I don't want that. I just, you know, so we decided on four levels very uh, purposefully mm -hmm. to not follow a grading scale and had a whole lot of dialogue over what do we even call those levels? Mm -hmm. What do you call something? What do you call a person, rather, who has really no experience or just very baseline idea of what's going on? Do you mm -hmm. call them a novice? Do you call them a beginner? Do you, you know, that was probably one of the biggest conversations we had of what do we even call things? Mm -hmm. So we settled on uh, the four levels based on things maybe the kids could, could identify with. Like the master has the, um, the, the sorcerer's hat, the wizard's hat, because you're a wizard, you're the best at everything. The, uh, the novice, the apprentice, the, the 
most beginning level, if you will, mm -hmm. has the construction worker hat with the light on it because you need to see your way. Now, will the children associate that with something else? I, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have one that looks like an Indiana Jones hat. We have a graduate cap for the experienced part. Right. And then came the, uh, the definition of, okay, so then what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does it mean if you're a master of something? And we needed to think, we did it actually in, in, from two perspectives. To the teacher, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And then to the child, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So um, what we also did was we created a set of four posters and it would have in big words, you know, creativity or collaboration, whatever it was, and then a child-friendly definition of what that meant. So when the teacher started to weave these into his or her lessons, the students could say, okay, now when she talks about creativity, I understand that it's not me copying or me, you know, using your idea off of the internet and turning it into my own artwork. Right. So then we also have uh, a resource for teachers that literally looks like a hat rack. And uh, it's posted in our classrooms, so and um, it has all of the four hats, and it says, which hat are you wearing today? Mm -hmm. And it has a little brief description of the, the master, the apprentice, you know, all, all the four levels. And I've seen where teachers will conclude a lesson and invite children to share, which hat did you wear today? And it's okay mm -hmm. if you're a novice. That's the opening lesson. Oh, I saw the greatest lesson of the first experience with these 21st century skills weren't even about, this was a music class, and it wasn't even about music. Just where in your life are you a novice? Are you a master? Because it's okay to move back and forth. The idea isn't master. to be at everything at the end of every grade level. Right, right. <laughs> um, but it's, it's okay to say, you know what? I have questions, mm -hmm. and here's what I need to do to move to the next level. So it was very rich conversation with the teachers of saying, how do we communicate um, not necessarily a concrete example of what it looks like, because that's part of the beauty and the confusion of all of this, Right? is we cannot tell you a master looks like this, because it depends where you started from. Yes. If I started out as a master according to the success criteria, then what does master look like for me? Right. Might look different for my shoulder partner here who started out at the apprentice level. Yep. So, you know, it's, it's a, lot of, um, a lot of brain power going into these for teachers to think, okay, then how do I reach kids? How do I have students reflect of where am I and then where do I need to go? Because I did go into classrooms and, is this good enough? Am I done yet? Is this okay? Yeah. So another, another piece behind why we did this in the first place was to say, okay, how can we get students to self-motivate and look, how can I make this better? What can I do to move to the next level? Instead of running up and saying, Mrs. Riley, does this sound right? Right. Because that's not the point. It doesn't need to sound right to me. It needs to sound right to you. Yeah, so. Well, and I think what's so incredibly valuable about that in the arts process and the artistic experience is that if you were to talk to a master, I don't know that they would say that they're done. You know, I don't know that they would call themselves a master because they're always, there is that intrinsic drive uh -huh. and this allows for that and it takes the stigma away. I mean, I know so many kids who will walk in and they're out for that A, you know, and once they get the A, they're done, right? They're, it's mm -hmm. like, I'm finished, I don't need to do anymore and this allows them to go between levels, yes. gives, takes away that stigma, and at the same time embeds the idea that we're always learning. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the populations we don't talk about enough are gifted and talented kids. You know, we, we talk a lot about the middle, we talk a lot about raising achievement scores, yes. and we talk a lot about students who need a lot of support. Yes. But what about those learners who blow through everything and they're you know you know that they're gifted and talented but it's like we let them go right we mm -hmm. we don't miss we think oh they got it i don't need to worry about them and so they end up sliding backwards right. because there's no push for them and so i love that these scales allow them to think about okay while i'm the master over here maybe compared to other students i'm not a master for me yet yes so that is so incredible. I just love this idea. The, the challenge is real. Yeah, and we, we actually had some uh, professional development last year specifically mm -hmm. targeted toward the gifted and talented child 
in the fine arts. What do you do with those students who not only blow through your project, your assignment in 10 minutes, but they do it right? Yes. And now they have 30 minutes of what do I do now? Right. Those kinds of scales. Well, here, look, where are you on all of this? And how can you, you know, move yourself up to another level? Mm -hmm. um, really, they are, they're good for everyone. I was just um, gonna ask. <laughs> I can roll just right into this. <laughs> do they have to be used in just arts classrooms, or can they not just arts classrooms? I mean, I think this is really in cool. only arts classrooms, right? Yeah. But um, can they be used across the board? Absolutely, and I have a, a kind of zero entry plan for weaving this in. Um, one of the most gratifying outcomes of the curriculum writing that we did was that towards the end of the, the whole session, I did four weeks this summer, and at the end we have the um, administrative leadership meeting. Mm -hmm. And we sort of set up the cafeteria as a science fair style of all the content areas. Right. And the administrators come around and they talk to the teachers, they talk to the curricular leaders of what did you do, what can I expect to see. Mm -hmm. And we talked about these 21st century skills. and. The second principal that came by looked at them and she studied them and she goes, well, we could use this in our language arts room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we could do this for math too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was perfect. I'm like, yeah, that's the point. It's not, it isn't meant to be contained within the fine arts room. The skills and the, the vocabulary were very deliberately chosen to not be arts centric. Mm -hmm. So I already, I have a couple of buildings where teachers have said, can we have these? Can we give these to classroom teachers? Yes, please, by all means. I would love to walk into any grade level classroom anywhere in Frederick County and see these hanging. We're only three months, two or three months into it, so it's a little <laughs> premature, but absolutely, these scales, I mean, I will share them with anybody and anyone who wants them. They, you know, work is at its best when it's shared and, and used by other people, yeah. you know, others than those created it. Absolutely, so do you see this as a, a a doorway into maybe arts integration and STEAM as a way for people to have those kinds of collaborative conversations and develop that? I think that um, the scales could serve as almost sort of a comfort zone for those who are not fine arts teachers who may be a little hesitant to add the A to STEM or to do the arts integration because of the, you know, the common pain point of, I'm not a musician, I can't sing and I can't draw, so therefore I can't do it. Right. Well, the scales show that it's not really on the teacher to do that, it's more on the student to explore his or her art, art, you know, artistic or musical behavior. And when you look at those, it gives you sort of a framework for those unboxable characteristics of artistic learning. I mean, how do you assign a number value to creativity, to collaboration, and how does that apply in the arts? Well, here's where it came from. This came from the arts, so it works for us. Hopefully, yes, that will be, a, it would be a good resource for classroom teachers who are interested in jumping in with arts integration and STEAM as to how you can work in these skills that aren't so easy to track with paper and pencil. Yeah, so I want to wrap up one last question because I can already I can already hear it. I've I've heard it so many times <laughs> in every, different things that I've presented. So, um, how do you get parents and other stakeholders on board with this when they when they're so used to seeing grades come home A's B's C's mm -hmm. or they can't quantify like I've, I've even seen elementary school parents in like first and second grade you know when you give students like satisfactory outstanding whatever that they will come in and say does this what translates to an A what translates to a B so how do you foresee being able to kind of have those conversations with parents and try to get them to understand that um you know I think our, our teachers do a great job of being in contact with parents. They send home the newsletters and they send home resources. But these scales in particular, the ABC grades are, I think, what we're used to as a culture. Yeah. And perhaps no matter what we do, we have in our mind what an A is. Mm -hmm. And as a teacher, that was never really where the conversations were. It was always around this effort grade. Mm -hmm. of how can you tell me that my child isn't giving effort, isn't going above and beyond. And you know, as I've mentioned before, that was one of the biggest catalysts behind these scales. Let me show you how we look at how the students have the opportunity to reflect. Let me show you through this recording or through this snapshot of their final piece where they are on this and they have the opportunity to reflect. Really, it is just bringing parents in and, and the, the gift of time too. Yeah. This is very, very different than anything that we're used to. Mm -hmm. 
um, our teachers are getting used to it too. So once the teachers can get accustomed to sort of where we're heading as a county, then I think the conversations between administrators and, and other stakeholders, the community and parents and such, will become a little easier once the teachers have a, a full grasp. This is one of the biggest um, requests we have this year, more professional development and how do I do this? How do I incorporate these scales into my teaching, which is fantastic. So that's one of my charges for this year <laughs> is to work with the staff that wants it, that, that is really buying into it now. So I think that question will have a little more solid of an answer by the end of this year once we've had the chance to work with and have conversations with parents and administrators to sort of gauge the understanding level to judge where we need to go from there. That's great. Well, Susan Thomas, thank you so much for joining thank me you. today. I really appreciate it. No problem. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And be sure to check out Teaching with Creativity for more ideas and tips and techniques, just like the one you saw today. Thank you so much to Susan Thomas for sharing her wonderful expertise with us today. And if you found this valuable, please consider sharing it with your friends or colleagues and leaving us a review over on iTunes or on YouTube so that others can find this show as well. Thanks so much, and I'll see you on our next episode. Looking to add more creativity to your classroom? Excited by the idea of arts integration, STEAM, and project-based learning, but not sure how to fit it into your busy curriculum? Try an online class from Education Closet. You'll receive a 10-hour PD certificate for each class that you complete. Each training is self-paced, includes lifetime access, and takes place in a modern video-based platform. You can use it on any device. You can learn anything from how to build a STEAM program to classroom management for hands-on learning experiences. It's your year to thrive, teachers. Visit educationcloset.com forward slash courses for more information and to get started today.